Thanks for joining us on another episode of Space Nuts. Always great to have your company. And on this week's show, we've got a couple of asteroid stories to talk about, uh, one that hit China about 50,000 years ago and a potential asteroid strike on Earth. Uh, looks like it's been averted, not due to anything we did. Uh, it just uh, has been reported in the news as no longer going to hit Earth, so how could it be both? Uh, we'll look at that. Uh, there's, there's a strange black hole that has been discovered that's spinning on its side. And we're going to answer some uh, text questions today uh, because we haven't done any for a while uh, about the speed of light, about whether or not we're living in a simulation. That's a really good one. Uh, and uh, when will we set foot on Mars and could we live on Io and Titan one day? Those uh, stories coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and uh, we appreciate your support. And with me, as always, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. What a surprise. It's me. <laughs> yes. I was expecting uh, someone completely different. No, no. But... One day that'll happen and you'll I... think, what? <laughs> what? what? No, I don't somebody... know about that. No, well, <laughs> maybe not. Anyway, I'm here and thank you, Andrew. Always good to be part of space. Not... I appreciate it. Um, now, we've got a bit to get through and uh, we'll start off by talking about a couple of asteroids, one that mm -hmm. uh, hit the Earth about 50,000 years ago and one that was due to hit the Earth not, not too long from now, but now it won't. We'll get to that. Uh, but uh, this uh, impact crater that they've discovered is uh, in China. Uh, is this only a recent discovery? It is, yes, a couple of years ago, um, and I think um, what we're seeing now is the is the you know the scientific paper uh, that, uh, that 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 uh, describes what has been found. Uh, it's in the journal Meteorics and Planetary Science, and so it's a, a really interesting one because um, China, until a couple of years ago, only had one known impact crater. Uh, it's called the Shuyang Crater. Um, which was about, or still is, I should say, uh, it is about, um, I think it's about 1.2 or thereabouts kilometres in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Um, but the new one, uh, which has been discovered in a place called uh, Yilan, uh, that is bigger. And in fact, it's now a record breaker because uh, it's been dated, and this is all reported in the in the paper I mentioned, um, by actually by um, carbon fourteen dating of of the uh, of charcoal um, be because it would have you know the impact would have burned wood and uh, there's actually um, probably formed a lake in the crater at one point as well and there's there's lake sediments which have been dated as well these in the ge in the geological record yep. and uh, the suggestion is that it was formed between forty six thousand and fifty three thousand years ago which is about the same age as the meteor crater that you and I have both visited in Arizona, uh, the Barringer Crater, uh, that's about 50,000 years old. But the interesting thing is that the Yilan Crater, the newly discovered one, is bigger than mm. the Arizona Crater at about 1.85 kilometres in diameter compared with about 1.2 kilometres for the, for the meteor crater in Arizona. And yeah. that makes it the biggest crater on Earth under 100,000 years old. Uh, okay, right. Um, so there are <laughs> older ones that are bigger. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's right. There are. Um, and, well, the Chicxulub crater would probably count. Yeah, it would count. And and you you sort of you know in a, in a sense that's um, that's a, a good. It's a worth an interesting statistic because the further back in time we go, uh, the the bigger the objects we expect to find still roaming around the solar system in a wanton and uncontrolled way. Mm. Uh, uh, even though 100,000 years is not long compared with the 4.6 billion years age of the Earth. But <clears throat> the, 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 as time progresses, uh, you get fewer large bodies. Um, and, of course, now we're in this situation where 
bodies greater than a kilometer, um, pretty well all of them, I think it's a 90% completeness, have been dis discovered when you do the statistics. So, um, yeah, a, a rather interesting. What would have formed it? Probably an object, probably not that much bigger than the thing that exploded over uh, Tunguska oh. back in 1908. Uh, um, but more solid. Uh, it's thought to have been uh, a, probably an iron meteor or a, an iron asteroid, which means it's a part of a chunk of of the core of a, of a protoplanet, a planet that was in the process of forming, because uh, yeah. all the iron sinks to the middle. Uh, and so you get these iron asteroids and iron uh, uh, meteorites that, that actually are uh, the remnants of the cores of, of planets that have been banged into by other things. Or planet, planet, planetismals is actually the, the correct term, these small objects. Protoplanets is what they grow into. Planetismals mm. are the size of a large asteroid, but they're big enough to, to have differentiated. That's to say the, the iron has sunk to the, to the, the, the middle uh, under its own gravity. So it's been hot, hot enough for that iron to flow and uh, big enough to be differentiated. Uh, so uh, what we think this might have been is the, is the remnants of one of those. Uh, the, there is evidence from the bottom of the crater that it was indeed an impact crater rather than you know, something volcanic. Uh, there's shocked quartz, which is spoken about a lot in impact circles. This is quartz that's basically been shocked uh, yeah. by the temperature of the impact. There's uh, melted granite. Um, uh, there's there's actually um, volcanic glass, or or the, 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 you know, the, when you get high enough temperatures with rock with silicates, you you you, you form glass. Yeah. Uh, but it it's got holes in it which would have had gas bubbles in uh, and and all lots and lots of other um, symptoms of a of an impact and it's actually worth following up on the web um, uh, if our listeners care to do that because there there's some rather nice aerial photography it's actually landsat photography i think um, showing this crater uh, looking exactly like an impact crater it's, mm. it's in the hills in a in farming country um, it's a sort of mountain range uh, and uh, it's it, it's incomplete. The southeastern quadrant is missing. Um, it's not clear why that should be, whether it's by erosion or some sort of asymmetry in the formation of the crater. Uh, but uh, yeah, very interesting, very interesting discovery. And as I said, it's worth looking up the the Landsat images because it's it's very crater like. It's just yeah. a circular feature. If you do a, a search for um, Young Impact Crater China, you'll probably find it. But yeah. It's on the SciTech Daily website. Yeah. Uh, a great story about it there. Uh, I was wondering, Fred, what China might have been like 50,000 years ago. I'm guessing there would have only been half a billion people. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it would have been very sparsely populated. I think, I mean, China's a big, very big country. It's got it a is. large land area. <clears throat> um and yes, the climate would have certainly been different because we know that uh, since then there's been at least one ice age and possibly more. Uh, so, um, yeah, a different sort of place. Um, what One little detail that I really liked, it's it's apparently in really heavily forested country, um, and that might be why it's not really been recognised. Apparently it's the autumnal foliage on the trees that make it show up uh, and the, in the Landsat image. Um, but it's it's got a name, a local name, which I'm going to mispronounce probably, Quan Shan, uh, and apparently that translates as Circular Mountain Ridge. So yeah, the locals knew it as a circular feature. That's right. Yeah, I, I'm I'm guessing they probably didn't realise what it was what it was. Caused by. That's right. Uh, you mentioned um, the comparison to the size of the object with uh, Tunguska. But uh, I, I remember us recently talking about Tunguska possibly being a, a planet grazer. It didn't actually yeah, hit yeah. the ground at all. So um, that that's right. Uh, but this one did. Obviously, it was an uh, impact crater. But uh, t yeah, Tunguska was a uh, something that exploded or, or grazed the Earth. Yes, and, 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 and hit a, directly a, det a detonation in the atmosphere, mm. uh, which this might have done as well. It may well have burned up some of its material in the atmosphere. Uh, but certainly was big enough to cause a crater on Earth. And that would have been locally pretty devastating. Um, 
you know, there, there would have been effects. There would have been uh, uh, a lot of material thrown up into the atmosphere. So there would have been uh, possibly a bit of temperature change in the area. Yep. Um, maybe global effects like we've, you know, we've seen curious atmospheric phenomena because of the um, the, the Tonga volcano uh, putting aerosols and, and dust into the atmosphere. Mm. been a lot of really unusual sunsets and things like that, which I think are still going on. I, I don't know. I haven't seen a sunset for about three weeks because <laughs> of the cloud that we've got here. Yes, well, we, we've had um, plenty of cloudy days in, in recent weeks as well. It's uh, It's been a very unusual summer for us, much, much cooler than yep. normal. We've We've had temperatures out here that have just barely scraped into the low 30s when we're normally pushing towards 40 this time of year. It's a very, very mild summer, which correlates with uh, a heck of a lot of rain. And we've seen all those floods uh, up north of where I am, uh, about six hours drive from where I am, uh, around northeastern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. That's that's just a horrible tragedy with uh, so much flood water. And um, places like uh, Lismore, for example, where I lived for a short time, I uh, worked on the local radio station there, 2LM, for a while, and they've had a record-breaking flood. They haven't had a flood that big since records began. It's just been incredible what's been happening. I did ask a few people overseas what they thought of the floods, and they went, what floods? All that's <laughs> on in the news in, in other countries is, um, is yeah. uh, Ukraine for yeah. obvious reasons, but yeah. uh, the floods have barely rated a mention outside of Australia from what I understand, but... Yeah, it's been pretty horrendous here for a lot of people and um, it's not over yet. There's a big East Coast low coming in on you, Fred, isn't there? That's right. Yes, I'm keeping an eye on the um, on the, on the the rain radar. Um, uh, I nipped out just a minute ago to clear gum nuts off one of our drains that blocks, blocks the drain up. Yeah, they do. Floods, they? floods our back path, so yeah. Mm. <laughs> Okay, well, let's continue on with our discussion about asteroids because uh, we, we, we've talked about a, a couple of strikes in uh, recent times on Earth and there was one particular asteroid that was uh, in the news uh, only in the last week or so, 2022 AE1, which they thought would impact Earth sometime in the middle of next year and now all of a sudden it won't. And, of course, the popular press is jumping all over this and saying, oh, gosh, it moved. What happened? How did that, you know, <laughs> yeah. don't they move in a straight line? No, they don't. But, um, yeah, this, this is an unusual case. It is a little bit, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this was discovered on the 7th of January. Uh, you're quite right. It was 2022 AE1. Um, and the thing about... Discovering asteroids, Andrew, is that you, it, what you're looking at, all you're seeing is a dot of light. Mm. Um, so just taking one image of the sky doesn't reveal an asteroid. But if you take two and you detect an object that's moving between the two uh, images, you know, maybe if they're an hour apart or a few minutes apart or something like that, you'll get movement in it. Um, and that tells you that it's a nearby object, that it's an asteroid. Uh, but you need three observations to get a first approximation of its orbit. And that's what happened. The, there were three observations made. Um, a, an orbit was calculated. This is all done automatically now. Um, yeah. There's a, a thing called the uh, Asteroid Orbit Determination Automatic System, uh, which is, you know, basically um, uh, part of, it's actually part of ESA's Near Earth Object Coordination Center. So the, the, it all happens automatically. And it flags the asteroid as having a risk on, uh, one or both of the two scales that we measure asteroid risk, the Torino scale and the Palermo scale, uh, both of them are, um, uh, you know, what they do is they, they, they uh, rank collision probability with size, the amount of energy that this thing's going to deliver, um, and uh, essentially give you a score. So this got flagged on the Palermo scale uh, because uh, those first observations indicated if I remember rightly, it was going to be the 4th of July when it was going to hit. Yes, the, I think that was right. 2023. July 2023, yeah. yeah. Um, and so more observations were made in subsequent nights, uh, but then the thing got too near to the moon to observe, so it was sort of drowned out by the moon. Um, uh, what, and, and at that stage, uh, it was still a, uh, a an object of interest. It was still something that uh, had a chance of, of hitting 
at the Earth in 2023. It was the 12th to the 19th of January um, when the, the the object couldn't be seen because because the the moon was too bright and mm. too near to it. Um, so they got further observations uh, after that. Uh, I can't remember whether it was the 20th of January. It's thereabouts, and that that next observation immediately ruled out the possibility of a collision. Um, and so what's happening here, Andrew, is that uh, it's all about how much of what we call the arc, how much of an orbit you can observe. Uh, and if you've got just a short chunk, like the, the amount of an orbit that an asteroid covers in one night, you can get a deduction of what its orbit is, but it's got huge uncertainties Yeah, uh, because you're only observing over a very tiny arc of the orbit. And as you as you progress, as the, you track the object over subsequent nights, you can actually refine uh, the orbit and those probabilities come down, those uncertainties in where it will be down the track are reduced. And that's why when it was observed over a long enough arc after the, 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 the full moon period, uh, it was uh, immediately obvious that this was not going to collide with the Earth because the probability shrinks uh, enough that it, oh, sorry, the uncertainty in the measurement shrinks enough that it tells you that there won't be a collision. Yeah, it's going to miss us by a few million. It's 10 million kilometres. 10 million kilometres, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the Torino scale. It looks like a, a risk matrix that you do. It, it is. Like, like when I worked for the ABC, we used yeah. to have to do risk matrix <laughs> assessments before That's we right. did outside broadcast to, to yep. you know to d- decide whether or not it was too dangerous. Um, but this one, it gives you the size of the object and uh, the collision probability and the ultimate effect if it does hit. Yep. So a five kilometer object with a um, a, a a certain collision probability would have a global yeah, effect. Yeah, it would. Uh, it and would. it goes down. This one, they reckon, would have been a, a, a localised effect. That's right, yeah. Once again, uh, an object actually probably similar in size to uh, to maybe the, um, uh, the, the Chelyabinsk uh, impactor, the one that uh, exploded mm. over Russia back in 2013. So that, that rates an eight on the Torino scale. Yeah. Yeah, that's still that's still way up there. Uh, it, it prompts me to ask another question about asteroids uh, and and their impacts on Earth. Are there certain parts of the planet that that can't get hit because of the the way the angles work, or is everything exposed? Uh, it's a good question, actually. Um, we, yes, everything is exposed because uh, whilst asteroids. I guess if you think of asteroids mostly being in the plane of the solar system, um, then uh, as you get nearer the poles, your probability is reduced, Mm. Um, although it's still possible for impacts to happen near the poles. But in fact, uh, with asteroids, their orbital inclination uh, ranges over quite a high level. They, They are... You know they are concentrated to the plane of the solar system, but there's there's some that come in at quite high angles, and um, you know that the, the Earth's just a doesn't matter which direction you're coming in from, uh, the Earth's the same target. And if they're coming in over the pole, then yeah, you can get them near the poles as well. Interesting. Just wondered about that. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you want to uh, find out more about this uh, near miss that's no longer a near miss or the near hit that's no longer a near hit about uh, 2022 AE1, uh, there's a great story about it on the phys.org website, phys.org. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Let me take a moment to talk to you about our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, uh, we've got a special deal going at the moment. Uh, as a Space Nuts listener, uh, a special price for you, which I'll get to shortly. But why do you need a virtual private network? Well, protection, basically. Uh, Cybercrime has become a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. And there are a lot of people who spend uh, all their time looking at ways of hacking people like you and me and your friends and your family to get hold of your money. It's really that simple, looking for keywords, looking for passwords, looking for uh, patterns in your typing when you're on your computer. You can stop all that as simply as 
putting on a VPN service. And the best one in the business is NordVPN. Uh, it makes your online data unreadable to outsiders, and that includes hackers. It secures your PC, your laptop, your smart device, even your smartphone. Uh, you can, uh, with NordVPN, protect up to six devices at the same time. And another way it protects you is it changes your IP address. So they don't really know who you are or where you're from. And it opens you up to the world because it uh, breaks down those geo-blocking barriers. Uh, Nord is fast. It's the fastest VPN in the business. It's reliable. There's 24-hour, seven-day-a-week support, and it's highly revered. It gets a lot of good press, basically. So take advantage of the, the offer that's available now as a Space Nuts listener through the URL nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn dot com slash space nuts and the code you'll need is space nuts grab the deal today for a huge discount off nordvpn plus one month it's risk-free there's a 30-day money-back guarantee and because it's their 10th birthday there's a bonus gift that's nordvpn.com slash space nuts use the code word space nuts now, back to the show. Roger, you're allowed to stay here also. Space Nuts. Now, if you want to help us out uh, on Space Nuts, but you don't want to kick the can for, um, you know, a monthly uh, contribution as a patron, although that is certainly something that is um, most welcome as well, you can do a review. Now, I don't know which podcast distributor you use. There are many, and we're on all of them. Uh, but if you uh, like the program uh, and want to leave a review, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the more reviews the, that we get, the more attention we get and the higher up in the rankings we go and the more people that listen and that increases our community and makes for a lot more fun and enjoyment and, yeah, it helps out a lot. So if you'd like to leave a review on your favourite podcast distributor, uh, that would be um that will be fabulous. So we'll leave that one with you. Uh, and if you are interested in becoming a patron, jump on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Now, uh, Fred, this is a rather interesting black hole story, and this one's a little bit different because um, this uh, they're describing this in the um, um, SciTech Daily website as a death spiral. Uh this is a um, a black hole that's sort of um, rotating flat on its back, <laughs> like like Uranus, I, I guess. It's a bit yes, that's right. It's uh, it's not quite as acute as Uranus is, but it's um, definitely well tilted over. Uh, so this is research that's come from scientists actually in a place where I visited. I've, I may even have met some of the scientists in question uh, up in Finland, the University of Turku in Finland and their Tuora Observatory, which is in a lovely spot uh, outside Turku. That's where these researchers are based, but they've used a telescope in La Palma um, that I'm all also familiar with, uh, the Nordic Optical Telescope operated by the Finns and the and the Danes. Um, uh, it, we always used to joke about, I used to work quite a lot in La Palma in the Canary Islands and uh, watch the Nordic Optical Telescope being built back in the 90s. Uh, it was always um, a joke that its acronym is not. So this was not the telescope. Um, it's uh, the Nordic Optical Telescope, the NOT. Uh, it does <laughs> great stuff though, um, great work. If I remember right, it's about a three, three and a half metre, I think. Is that right, correct? Right. Something like that. You, anyway. And you said you saw it being built in Indeed, the 90s, yeah. the, the 1890s. What was... uh, thanks, Andrew. That was <laughs> wide open for that one, wasn't it? Yes, it was the 1890s. That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, yeah, actually, I'd just you take me straight back to it. Uh, the 80, it wasn't quite the 1890s. It was a bit earlier than that. But that was where Charles Piazzi Smythe, who was uh, this eventually the Astronomer Royal for Scotland, did his first work on, on determining that mountains are great places to build observatories. Oh. And he did it in the Canary Islands. There you are. Uh, not, uh, not on La Palma, but on Tenerife. And uh, he uh, hauled his gear up to Teide, which is the volcanic peak on Tenerife, and determined that this, you know, the exquisite viewing that you get from those heights is well worth the trouble. Uh, and, of course, that was the start of mountain astronomy. It was a bit before the 1890s. There you go. There's a digression. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. But um, the, to the story. So what we've got, uh, and this was discovered by X-ray 
astronomers. Um, I think the follow-up work was done with the NOT, the NOT Nordic Optical Telescope. Um, it's a, so it's an object called, uh, wait for it, Maxi J1820 plus 070, uh, and it's an X-ray source. Uh, and what we have is a, a binary pair with uh, a, a, a massive star uh, in orbit around a black hole. And the star is close enough that material is leaching from the star onto the into the black hole's accretion disk. So mm -hmm. you've got this star in orbit around the black hole, um, a, a disk of material which is rapidly spinning, highly energetic. That's where the X-rays come from. And it's the stuff swirling down the plug hole before it gets swallowed up by the black hole. Yep. So that's a fairly standard scenario. Uh, we see that uh, very frequently. But what's not standard is that like many black holes, this one uh, squirts out material from its poles. And that's material that has been kind of grabbed by the magnetic fields of the black hole from the accretion disk and sent out usually at right angles to the accretion disk. So it's coming mm -hmm. out uh, you know, along the, the axis of rotation. Uh, and it is indeed the axis of rotation of the black hole. We talked about this last week. Uh, how can something with zero dimensions have an axis of rotation? Well, it does. Um, but in this case, the stuff is being squirted out, yes, in form of jets of material, which once again can be detected by X-rays uh, and radio telescopes too. Um, but the jet is tilted over at more than yeah. 40 degrees to the to the you know the perpendicular to the accretion disk and that is bizarre in fact it's it's the first time that has ever been seen mm. and the obvious question is why do we why? think it's doing that <laughs> yeah so um uh, as as the mentioned SciTech daily uh, as the article uh, says um uh the finding challenges current theoretical models of black hole formation. There you are. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, the theory at the moment struggles to to allow something like this. Um, I think it's the lead author uh, who's got. He's made a comment uh, about this. Um, he's got a lovely Finnish name, Yuri Putanen. Uh, and he's a professor of astronomy at Turku University, and he says the difference of more than 40 degrees between the orbital axis and the black hole spin was completely unexpected. Scientists have often assumed this distance to be very small when they've modelled the behaviour of matter in a curved space-time around a black hole. The current models are already really complex, and the new findings force us to add a new dimension to them. Um, in other words, I think the theoreticians are struggling to make this fit the, you know, the normal paradigm for how black holes form and what they, how they behave when they're formed. It's such yeah. an extraordinary and unexpected result. Indeed. And, uh, yeah, you couldn't sort of simply say, well, something must have knocked it over because it's a black hole. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's not that simple. Yeah, that, that's right. It's not that simple. Um, it, it, it sort of makes you wonder whether it's the, I don't know, no, that doesn't fit either. <laughs> I was just going to theorise that the accretion disk has slipped. But, of course, the accretion disk, the plane of the accretion disk is the same plane in which the, the companion star orbits yeah. uh, because it's feeding material onto the accretion disk. So that doesn't fit the picture either. I think it's the black hole that's been knocked over, Andrew. I think you've got it in a nutshell there, but oh. I don't know how it's been done. <laughs> no, maybe another black hole. It could just be the way it's formed, you know, some really peculiar phenomenon as the black when the black hole has collapsed uh, from uh, from the nucleus of a, a star at the end of its life. There, yeah, Very, maybe there was some kind of disturbance at the yeah, at the yeah. moment of formation. Could be. Who know. knows what it might have been? Yeah, uh, but it's uh, it's fascinating, and you can uh, go to the SciTech Daily website and read all about it. It's um, a yeah, great little animation there showing what's happening as well. This is Space Nuts. Thanks for joining us. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a short break from the show to talk about our sponsor, 
Magic Mind. Now, uh, over the last few weeks, I've been telling you about Magic Mind, this uh, product made of uh, natural ingredients to help you think better. And I set myself up as a, a bit of a guinea pig to see whether or not this actually worked for me. And uh, I have been taking Magic Mind for two solid weeks every morning. And, well, the big question is, did it make a difference? My answer is yes. My answer is yes. I felt uh, much brighter uh, within a short period of time of taking Magic Mind. I felt more wide awake during the course of the day. And I think I was uh, making better decisions or at least thinking more clearly about decisions I had to make. Now, the big experiment for me was whether or not it improved my golf. Well, no, it didn't. But golf's that kind of game. You can think brilliantly and still not have a good score. But what I found interesting, and I only read this on the Magic Mind website this morning, is that it can keep you calmer under a stressful situation. And I must say that definitely happened during my last two or three rounds of golf. I would make a mistake and normally I'd have a little hissy fit about it. But I found myself just shrugging it off. That was really quite amazing and I didn't expect that. I I didn't know that that was also an effect they defined in taking Magic Mind. So that was quite a a nice surprise. So, yes, I I do believe that it uh, helped me just sort of get over the bad stuff on the golf course much more easily. Uh, One of the other interesting things, and I don't know if they've actually looked into this as as an effect of Magic Mind, is I had some really amazing dreams, really quite vivid, uh, lucid dreams over the last few weeks and um, or last week and a half to be exact. And it was like going to sleep and watching a movie some nights and that doesn't happen to me very often. But I think every night for the last week, for sure, I've had really vivid, lucid dreams that were clear as crystal uh, and woke up with very solid memories of them. So uh, maybe there's something to that. This is all made of natural ingredients. And as a Space Nuts listener, you get a special offer. And all you have to do is go on uh, onto their website, magicmind.com slash space nuts, and there's a 10% off introductory deal as a Space Nuts listener. I'm not telling you to do it, but I am telling you that I think, in my case, the experiment was a success, and I would certainly encourage you to give it a go. I know, you know, it may not be for you. This is probably, you know, possibly something you just don't want to do. Well, that's fine, but if you need to find a, a a good way to get your brain kick-started of a morning without relying on caffeine, um, this is this is probably the way to go. Magicmind.com slash space nuts for a 10% off deal with your introductory order. And look, see how it goes and let us know. I'd really be keen to see um, your feedback too. Message us through our website. But uh, yeah, I, I must say I, I was delighted actually with, uh, with the effects and uh, I, I certainly don't hesitate to... Um, Uh, suggest to you to give it a try. The URL again, magicmind.com slash space nuts. Now back to the show. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Now, if you haven't visited our website lately, uh, why not do so? It's a lot of fun, plenty of things to do, including the Space Nuts shop, which has got all sorts of goodies uh, available if you're uh, interested. Uh, such as, oh, let's just go through the list, um, bubble-free stickers. There are mugs. I've got one on, on top of my head right there, see? That's oh, one yeah, of our yeah. mugs. Yeah. Uh, there are caps. There are shirts. There are hoodies. There are spiral notebooks. There are socks. I've got a pair of those too. Not on at the moment. Bucket hats. And the list goes on. Uh, and, of course, um, Fred's books are all available through the Space Nuts shops. And some other galah who <laughs> thinks he's a writer has put books on there too. Uh, it's all available through the Space Nuts shop on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. All righty, Fred, let's uh, answer some questions. We've got a, a few to do today. These are all text questions. We haven't done a bunch of text questions in a while. So let's uh, hear from Jeffrey in Colorado. Dear Fred and Andrew, I feel like my brain is broken and need help putting it back together. Uh, We all know how that feels. Uh, He says, we all know the speed of light in a vacuum is constant. In a recent episode, Fred said that light travels slower in glass than a vacuum. 
what if you fired photons into a glass rod in space? Would they go in at the speed of light, travel slower in the glass, and then come out at the speed of light? Can you help explain this and correct my faulty logic? Thanks for a wonderful show. I can't tell you how many times it's taken uh, taken me down the rabbit hole learning new <laughs> things. Cheers, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Lovely to hear from you. Speed of light. Uh, we know it can be affected by gravity. We know it can be affected by, well, all sorts of things. But uh, he's brought up an interesting experiment, I think. Yeah, that's right. And actually, he's right on the money. What he's saying is all correct. Uh, if you've got a long glass rod in space, and there might be such things, who knows, uh, light goes in at one end, it slows down to uh, the speed within glass at the other end, as it travels through and pops out at the at the other end. So um, it's quite interesting, because that, you know, in a sense, is an optical delay. If you imagine a beam of light that's traveling in space two beams of light one hits the glass rod and the other doesn't uh two parallel beams of light I should say when they come out the other end the one that was in the glass rod is behind uh the one that wasn't so yeah. it's yeah it's good stuff well and, and that's just a natural phenomenon it is it's the process of refraction and it's not just glass of course any any um, medium will do that any transparent medium water of course is another uh, and even air um, light is moving slower in air than than it is in uh, in, in a vacuum. Not so by very if much. I'm, if I'm outside in the sun, am I getting hit harder by the photons than if I'm standing inside behind the window? Uh, you are, but it's nothing to. It's that's because the glass absorbs some of the ultraviolet uh, of the of the sun's light, um, <laughs> but not but not much actually. You can still get very sunburned through oh, through yeah. a window. Yeah. <laughs> You can indeed. Yeah. All right. A, a short, easy answer for uh for I hope Jeffrey. so. Yeah, I hope so. Mm. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Oh, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, uh, this from uh, Lawrence, uh, who lives near Glasgow, Scotland. Hi, guys. Long-time listener, first-time question asker. I felt kind of bad about asking a question before I was actually supporting you in some way. So I bit the bullet this morning and signed up via Patreon. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I have been listening for years. We find your dulcet tones quite the sleep aid. <laughs> Look, we'll take whatever we get. <laughs> uh, like a warm, cosy blanket, he says, oh, if you will. Nice. <laughs> um, anyway, questions. Uh, given... The Moore's Law, the vast increase in computer graphics quality, AI, etc. do you think we live in a simulation? That's his first question. His second question is, what on earth, or when on earth, if you pardon the pun, will we actually set foot on Mars? We'll get to that. Moore's Law. Yeah, it was um, uh, I set out in the 80s, I think, Moore's Law, and it basically is the to do with the rate at which uh, the processing and storage power uh, of computers increases. It's something like, I might have this wrong, and I'm sure people will correct me because more people know laws <laughs> more about Moore's Law than I do. It's something like it doubles every three years or something of that sort. It might even be less than that. Um, and, of course, we've seen that, you know, in every facet of our lives. We, um, Especially with storage, um, you can now buy m miniature USB sticks that are about the size of a thimble that have 64 gigs of storage on them just yeah. incredible stuff that we would never have dreamed of 20 years ago um I, in fact i remember the party we had at the university of st andrews when i was studying uh there in the 60s we had a party when our ibm 360 machine was update upgraded to 256 kilobytes of storage that was <laughs> you know, just extraordinary. Well, you, you look at it compared to the computer on Apollo 11. Yes. Uh, right. You've got you've got more computing power. Absolutely. In your mobile phone. Yeah, probably even in your watch. <laughs> on, that's my phone. If you're watching on YouTube, that's what my grandchildren gave me for Christmas, that's my phone right. cover. That's me playing golf. They're very, very nicely done too. Yeah, yeah. very nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that uh, the, the uh, and I remember when thumb drives uh, or flash drives first came out, and they were like two hundred and fifty bucks, and they they could um, yeah. they could hold about I don't yeah. know two hundred fifty megabytes or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Not much. laughs> some ridiculously low amount of data. Yeah. 
So um, just carrying on from that, that um, Moore's law plays a big part in how science is carried out. And I'm thinking particularly of the square kilometre array. Uh, When that was being planned more than 10 years ago, um, the scientists who were designing it and, and, you know, projecting how it might be built knew that the computing power to deal with the data that comes from it uh, simply did not exist yet uh, Mm. at that time. And I think it may even not quite exist yet either because um, the square kilometre array is finally supposed to come on stream towards the end of the decade. Um, It will deliver uh, seven terabytes per second, I think I'm right, uh, in terms of the data flow. Just colossal, hard to get your head around. Mm. Um, And so might have that wrong, it might be per minute, but it's it's a very small interval and it's a lot of data. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, you, you need to be you need to be really ahead of the curve on Moore's law to handle that. And that's what's happening. Yeah. Uh, but turning to the other part of the question, uh, does it mean we, is there a chance that we live in a simulation? This has been asked a lot mm. by many scientists. And um, the, the only experiment that you can really do to determine that is to look for sort of granularity in uh, in some of the fundamental processes. And by that, what I mean is, by, by granularity, I mean um, the fact that uh, certain things are quantized. They occur in steps, um, like, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the fact that if you, tr- if you look at the charge on a, um, a charge of a, a piece of, well, the old trick, charging up a balloon by rubbing it on your chest and then sticking yes. it on the ceiling, um, that that charge is quantized. It comes in steps because it's measured in electrons. They're, you know, they're single units uh, of charge. And so um, we know that many things are are in, in steps like that. They're, they're, they're quantized. That's the whole basis of quantum theory. So what about space though and what about time and some people have argued that if you can determine that time actually moves in short steps rather than being a continuum or just a continuous process and if space is can be broken up into short steps rather than being a continuous thing then that would be evidence that we are living in a simulation because effectively the universe will be digitized the yeah. whole thing it's not an analog thing anymore um That's the extent of my knowledge on this. I'm sure there are researchers working on it. Uh, Nobody's come up yet with the definitive proof that we're living in a simulation, but it's an interesting suggestion. It is. Now, before we get to his question on Mars, uh, a question without notice. This came from uh, Richard in New Hampshire, and I'm only asking because it kind of relates. He says, I was watching uh, Brian Green and Leonard uh, Susskind Yep. recently discussed how information was saved to a holograph shell on the event horizon of a black hole. And he goes on to say that the, the holographic principle could apply to the entire universe. Yes, yes that's right. And um, he, he was asking you know, um, or suggesting uh, at the outer universe holographic shell, wouldn't that shell have to keep getting bigger and bigger as the arrow of time and entropy gave it more information to store. If that's the case, wouldn't space-time be expanding along with it as the size of the holograph grew? Couldn't dark energy simply be that the universe has to expand at an ever-increasing rate to keep up with the holographic shell that has to grow to keep up with the arrow of time and entropy? (laughs) And he wants his Nobel Prize. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good one. Um, uh, yeah, well, that's right. Um, ho- the holographic universe is still very speculative, I mm. have to say. It was a popular idea probably 30 years ago, actually, when it was first suggested. Um, so we, 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 mainstream physics doesn't, doesn't accept that idea. There is there's certainly a lot of work being done on information transfer in black holes, um, and the, um, Stephen Hawking had a memorable bet on uh, about whether information could come out of black holes, which he apparently lost because he said it couldn't, and it can. I think that's right. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, look, uh, a great suggestion. I'm not sure that the physics would necessarily hold up, uh, particularly if we 
don't have a holographic horizon. <laughs> and who knows? Mm. All right. So uh, to the second part of Lawrence's question, when we uh, when are we likely to set foot on Mars? Uh, the the date keeps changing. Uh, it's it's probably it's not changed that much. Um, twenty mid twenty thirties. There is one of, one of the windows. You know, there's only certain windows for for flights to Mars every two two years and two months. Yeah. Um, there's one in twenty thirty five, and I think NASA have had their eye on that one for a long time. Uh, but the Arte- Artemis program to get astronauts back to the moon has slipped, um, largely due to the pandemic. Uh, that's likely that any Mars, human Mars program would also have slipped. Mm. Okay. Um, thank you, Lawrence. Let's uh, move on to one final question um, relating to um, going to Mars. Uh, we've got uh, a question. I think the name is Bandanoot. Uh, from the UK. Uh, hey, Professor Fred and the other one. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Uh, I will only go with the, the first one. Um, what is the reality of humans setting uh, settling on Jupiter's moons of Io or Titan? How possible would that be? I think we've touched on this one recently in regard to Titan or we just talked about yeah. what's on the surface Titan, of that planet. Titan's a moon of Saturn. Um, Saturn, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what are the odds of settling on places? Pretty, like that? pretty low, I would think. Uh, yeah. Io is um, highly volcanic. It's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. It's covered in debris from volcanoes. I don't think you'd want to uh, even venture there. I think it's going to be a place that is best observed from above um, by remote sensing spacecraft. Um, of course, the other thing about uh, EO is that it's very near Jupiter's radiation belts and there's interactions of material between the radiation belts of Jupiter and, and the moon of EO. So it's, uh, it's I, I would say that's a pretty definite no. Uh, Titan's mm. interesting, um, but it's also a rather unfriendly place. It's got, um, first of all, surface temperature minus 190 Celsius, um, you've got a surface which is made of solid ice with lakes of liquid ethane and methane in it, but an atmosphere, and I, I can't remember the atmospheric pressure, but it's greater than Earth's pressure, I think, uh, um, which, you know, suggests that you'd, 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 a bit like being on Venus, you'd struggle uh, with the pressure. Um, so of all the places that I could see humans... Uh, walking on, yes, it's back to Mars. It's, it's Mars is the most similar planet to the Earth, even mm. though its pressure is only 0.6% of what the Earth is. Uh, nevertheless, it has enough in common with Earth that it, it, it's a likely place for humans to visit. Not sure about colonising, as you know, I'm not keen on that idea, but visiting is a different matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think there was a science fiction f- film recently released called the titan and it was about sending humans to titan okay. that what they had to do is genetically modify them to okay. adapt yeah. to the uh, environment and um that turned them into these weird wild creatures and it would be yeah. a bit yeah um was, was i didn't really enjoy the story that much but uh yeah um it was an interesting theory uh, i will throw in his second question just as a matter of interest um what are your thoughts on the pac-man theory where the universe is just one continuous loop so if you kept traveling in one direction in a straight line eventually you'd get back to where you started from i'm pretty sure we've tackled this one before yeah it's the that's the old idea of a closed universe that space yeah. curves in such a way that you, you you wind up back where you started um and the current thinking is that that all the measurements that have been made of the universe suggest that it's euclidean that means that parallel lines don't ever meet and uh-huh. uh, so space is in the in the greater universe is is similar to what it is here okay well, that one puts that to bed. Um, yeah. <laughs> actually, we've had a few questions today where the uh, the, the theories have sort of um, skewed with what the known reality is. Hmm. Yeah. Things have moved on. 
We have, yes, indeed. Um, uh, well, there you go. Uh, thank you for your questions and uh, appreciate them. And if you have questions for us, don't forget to log on to our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can send your questions in. You can do it via the AMA tab, uh, which is up at the top. And uh, there you will uh, be able to send an audio question or a text question. Or you can uh, click on the uh, link on the right-hand side, which basically asks, send us your voice message. It's actually more of a demand by the look of that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that's how you can do it. Uh, and while you're there, have a look around uh, Astronomy <laughs> Daily, uh, the shop, um, also uh, how to be a member of Space Nuts. There are membership membership options there as well. Spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. That wraps it up, Fred. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, Andrew. Always good to talk, and we'll speak again soon. We will indeed. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here, and thanks to Hugh in the studio who does all the not-so-essential and non-hard work to put it all together. <laughs> thanks, Hugh. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company again. We'll catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 15 seconds. Guidance. You know, that would be wrong. Where's the end? There it is. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.